This evening we're turning again to Matthew chapter 18. We're looking at the parables of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 18. I invite you to uh, stand with me if you can as we read God's precious and wonderful word. I think we'll begin with uh, verse 21. Then Peter came to him, that is Christ, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he had begun to set accounts, one of was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commended, commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servants fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? His master was angry, delivered him to the tortures until he should pay all that he was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for just the wonderful opportunity to read your word and then uh, to look at another of these parables that you have given us. I pray, Lord, that you will bless our time in the word this evening. And um, you have a message for us. You have an admonition for us. May we take it to heart. Uh, <clears throat> we really know it, but it's a good reminder. And uh, we just thank you for uh, thy Holy Spirit taking your word and applying your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Now, as we have already learn before we've looked at this parable a couple of times that Jesus gave this parable in light of what Peter had asked him and that was about forgiving you know Peter had gone to him and said you know do I forgive my brother as you know, if he sins against me seven times and so Jesus gives this parable after he gives a uh, uh, the fact to Peter no you should give forgive seven times 70. But also, as Jesus uh, introduces the parable, he mentions the fact that it's about the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the parable has to do with true believers, the relationship we have with each other. Now, what I'd like to do this evening, and uh, different, a little bit different than last time, is to consider the parable in a different light. Now, in this parable, Jesus presents the attitude of God concerning forgiveness by believers. The word servant here is used in the very broadest sense of those in submission to a sovereign. That is our position as believers, or should be. We're to be in submission to the king, to our Lord, to our God. 
And uh, Paul himself calls himself a bond servant of Christ. Uh, that's a voluntary thing. Uh, and we are that way too. We're bought with a price, obviously. But we also have the privilege and the honor and the responsibility to surrender ourselves completely to the Lord every day, all the time. Now, this servant, when he's caught, he owed an insurmountable amount. It was impossible for anyone to have paid that off, especially a servant in his position. He couldn't have done it. And when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, that person is faced with the fact that the extent of their sin is beyond comprehension. It is humanly unpayable. You know, when I grew up in the Catholic Church, we were taught about a thing called purgatory. And we were told that, you know, uh, if you died with a mortal sin, you just went to hell and that was that. But if you died without a mortal sin or were able to confess it or the priest got there in time and gave you extreme unction or last rites, I guess, to change the name, <clears throat> you, uh, you didn't go to hell, but you went to purgatory. And in purgatory, you would pay back in, by being tortured in the flame and all that uh, and, and pay back the debt of your sin. Well, that's heresy. It's not in the Bible. Purgatory isn't in the Bible. That concept isn't in the Bible. None of that stuff. Otherwise, what is Christ's death? Christ died for our sins. How many of our sins? All of our sins. We can't, and we can't pay back our sins. We can't. We, we could be in hell for, for eternity, or in purgatory, shall I say, for eternity, and it still wouldn't do any good. How sad to have that idea. Now, Paul himself, he saw his sin in the clear light of God's word. Every convicted sinner has a glimpse of the utter sinfulness of sin. If you'll notice in Romans in chapter 7 and verse 13, what Paul says here, Romans 7, 13. Paul says, has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not, but sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin, through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. It's kind of our problem. We don't think of sin as being very sinful. We also don't think of it as being that bad. You know, Job, when he saw his sin, the Bible tells us in Job 42 that he repented in dust and ashes. He humiliated himself. He was humiliated and he humiliated himself. He submitted himself totally to God. And when you read that, you go through all of what Job talked about and everything. You come that at him when God confronts him and everything. He has a different attitude. And he was a godly man. Now, the servant represents the unbeliever, that is this first servant, who has been given the knowledge of God. Again, in Romans and uh, chapter 1 uh, and verse uh, 18. Paul wrote, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And of course, we see that every single day. The world suppresses <clears throat> these truths. Now, they have a knowledge, unsaved people in some way or other, have a knowledge of life from God. God has made us. God has created us. 
God has breathed into us the breath of life. Every breath we take really comes from God. Every breath. And in Acts in chapter 17 and verse 25 we read, Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. He's talking about everybody. God gives everybody. When we were unsaved, God gave us so, so much. Now, he's given us much more, but he gave us so much. But the world doesn't want to recognize that. The world wants to say, no, that's not really true. God doesn't give me anything. I've heard people say that. I've heard people say, oh, God doesn't, hasn't given me anything. I got everything for myself. We could probably write that over the, as you're coming over the bridge, uh, any one of them, coming into Marin, I did it myself. I got it all myself. God didn't give me anything. They have knowledge of the opportunity to give God what is due him. Again, going to Romans in chapter 11 and verse 36, Apostle Paul writes this, For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Everything, everything comes from God. He has given us everything. And then if you turn for a moment to Colossians and uh, chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. Paul, writing to the Colossian Christians, he says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. That's everything, including governments, including leaders, including people who uh, invent things and people who make money and build companies and all that stuff, everything, it all comes from God. There is nothing that you and I could ever do in this life, a whole lifetime, that didn't come from God, made it possible. You know, I think of the fact that, <clears throat> you know, we we're so thankful to have doctors and nurses and technicians and, and all the other people who are involved in our health care. And it's wonderful what they've done and, and, and how so many things that they have created and invented and we see this and we experience it. But I always want to be reminded and always remind others, but ultimately God is our physician. He's the one that ultimately heals us. But what happens is that the unsaved with everything around them that shouts to them that God is the giver of life, that God is the sustainer of life, that God has given us everything, what do they do? They take it, they receive it, and they squander it. Now, the man in the parable not only embezzled what belonged to the king, but he consumed it upon himself, and there was nothing left. I don't know how he did that. You know, if you remember last time I told you, just figuring out made a day, it was two million or more. Now today we could do that almost going to the grocery store and, <laughs> and getting some gas, but in those days you couldn't have done that. How would he have spent that all? That's the state of the bankrupt sinner. That's the condition that we're all in until we come to know Christ. Now, this servant, realizing his unexcusable guilt, and I think probably sensing the goodness of the king, falls down and he prostrates himself to the king. That was an act of total submission. Now, this servant had been serving. He's not a slave. We understand he's a servant or all servants. 
Uh, and, uh, but he comes along and he basically says, I'm a slave, I'm a nothing, I don't deserve anything. He falls down before him. He throws himself completely on the monarch's mercy. The man was guilty, the man was condemned, the man was devastated, and he apparently at this point was genuinely sorry. He had no defense and he offered none. And in the same way, the sinner confronted by the Holy Spirit with the gospel and the conviction of their sin should acknowledge that they stand guilty and condemned before God. And we all understand that. If we're saved, we understand that because we have faced that. That has been what we've been confronted with. That God has made that so clear to us. And in some way, their only hope is to humble themselves, confess their sin, cast themselves upon God's mercy in Jesus Christ. And by the way, one of the sad things I think that is happening today is when the gospel is presented that there's no call for repentance, there's no call to recognize that we're lost. Uh, Christ is kind of presented as, well, he'll make your life a little bit better or he'll solve some of your problems or, you know, they, though, those things are great and wonderful. And I, and I look back and see all the things that God has done for me, had done for me, is doing for me, but the greatest and the most important and the one thing, and if nothing else he did, was to save me from my sins, to deal with my sins. I have been having a really blessed, precious time. I ran across uh, in uh, a magazine that I, I get, a Christian magazine, uh, and it um, shared uh, somewhere in there uh, about an individual who writes for the magazine sometimes and, and one of his books and I ordered it. I was really thankful I got it on Amazon. Huh? You, you, know, you can get anything on Amazon. And uh, it's just about our salvation. And, and it's, it's not big, but it's in depth. And it, it, you know, it takes each word. You know, we have so many words that we use, you know, and, and uh, sometimes we don't totally understand them, but it's just a blessing to think about them again and, and go through that. And uh, I know that uh, when I finish, I'm going to start all over again. And, uh, but, you know, what God has done for us, the salvation that we have, what he's done with our sin, how he has given us new life. Now, the king knew that despite the servant's good intentions, he couldn't ever do what he promised. I'll pay you back. He knew he couldn't do that. God knows that you and I can't pay the debt we owe. It's impossible. If, if, we, if we were a child, a young child, and all of a sudden realize, oh, I'm a sinner, okay, I accept Christ. And if that moment we could somehow become perfect the rest of our lives, it still wouldn't matter. Still wouldn't be sufficient. Just one sin condemns us. Paul said that, you know, if you commit one sin, you've committed them all. So the man only asks for patience, so he might try to repay the king. But what does the king do? He releases him and he forgave him his debt in full. It's paid in full. In full. That's what God does with the sin debt of those who come to him in humble sincere confession. It's paid in full. 
You know, when Jesus said it is finished, it's part of what he was saying, part of what he was saying. Now, what happens next in this parable is shocking. It's inconceivable until we realize that we are all, in one way or another, also guilty, just like this servant, doing what he's done. What does he do? Well, he goes to his fellow servant, somebody who came along and borrowed from him about four weeks' wages. You know, it's a lot, but compared to what he owed, it's nothing. And so what does the servant do? What does his fellow servant do? He does the exact same thing that this fellow did. He drops down to his knees, he pleads with him, he begs him, he submits himself and says, please give me time, I'll pay you back. And the first servant you know, it, it's, it, it, Jesus really, really <laughs> builds this up. He doesn't just say that the guy says, well, I can't, I'm not going to pay, you know, uh, I'm not going to forgive you. He says he grabs him by the neck. He throttles him. And says, you're going to pay. And then he throws him into prison. Wow. Now, when we read this, we can see here that these are two brothers, as far as Christians are concerned. They're both brothers in Christ. They're fellow servants. That's what Jesus is saying. So they're believers. And Jesus' teaching here our treatment of one another, especially when one of us does something to the other that hurts us in some way, whatever it might be. Now, as Christians, we're, we're to forgive, period. I think I mentioned last time, and I've heard this over and over, yeah, but they don't have to, they got to wait until they ask. No, that's not what the Bible says. Well, I don't feel like it. Too bad. They don't deserve it. Too bad. Who's responsible? I am. Remember, we went to Matthew 18. What happens in Matthew 18? If your brother sins against you, if they sin against you, you go where? To everybody else. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I thought that's what we did. How many times have I seen that happen? No, we go to whom? The one who offended us. We should especially be forgiving of one another. After all, we serve the same king. We belong to the same family. Unfortunately, as Christians, we sometimes reflect a similar arrogance and insensitivity as this forgiven servant. We have been totally and for ever forgiven of all offenses before God on the basis of His grace and mercy and love. And yet, sometimes we act as if we were forgiven based on our own merit. 
And so instead of reflecting the, the king's compassion, this first servant became angry at the thought that he himself was still owed some money. And so he demands that the man pay him. This kind of behavior seems unthinkable as we read this, as we hear this. Surely not. It's even bizarre. It's hard to believe that someone could act in such a way. It's hard to believe, isn't it? And that's exactly Jesus' point to Peter. Go back. What was the question? Peter says, how often do I have to forgive my brother? How often do I have to forgive my brother? Well, at least he wanted to forgive his brother. Sometimes Christians don't want to forgive each other. They sit on the, either side of the church. They go somewhere else. They don't talk to each other. When they say hello, it's like icicles. <laughs> and we could use a few tonight. <laughs> For a Christian to be unwilling to forgive one another is unthinkable, it's bizarre, it's ungodly. Now, of course, we see that the other servants are, they can't believe what's happened. And so they go to the king. They said, you know the one you two forgave that huge debt? Listen, they all knew. We all know, do we not? If you're a brother or sister in Christ, then I know, I don't know your sins, but I know that God has forgiven you a debt that cannot be repaid, just like he's done me, right? We don't have to sit down and compare, well, <laughs> I've been forgiven more sins, or you have, no. And so they're indignant. This, this first servant, he, he's placing himself above the king by acting as if he has a right to be less gracious and merciful than the king was to him. That is what we do when we do not forgive our brother or sister in Christ when they do something to us. Paul tells us don't go to law. In other words, don't go to the courts. Call us all somebody in the church. It's got wisdom to work the thing out for you. Or, if not, just let it go. Suffer, don't worry about it. Don't. And by the way, we should be deeply grieved when we find that a brother or sister in Christ does not forgive another brother or sister in Christ. It should grieve our hearts. It should pain us. Not only because of the hardness of their heart, but also it can drive the offender deeper in sin. Somebody sins against you and you don't forgive them? Things can go really bad for that other person. It also can cause dissension and division within the body of Christ. And it can tarnish the testimony of the church. The world acts that way. Those people out there act that way. We used to act that way. Now we've been saved. 
when it gets out, the world goes, well, what's the big difference between you guys and us? What difference did Christ make in your life? Well, the king was incensed. You know, when a Christian allows remaining sin to control an attitude or an action, they're being wicked because sin is always sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know it is very hard to say, I forgive you. Very hard to say, I'm sorry. But you have saved us. You have forgiven us. You have cleansed us. You have made us new creatures in Christ. Can we do less? No one can ever, ever do to us something worse than we've done to you. And we've experienced forgiveness complete without reservation and forever. Oh, give us, Lord, forgiving hearts as we look at what you've done for us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.